Hey everyone, my name is Lee. Today I'm at the top end of the Niagara River, about a mile outside the city of Niagara Falls. Um, and today I'm going to be doing something I've been wanting to do for a really long time now. Uh, and I figured since we're all kind of sitting at home anyway, might as well uh, hopefully t try and take some people along with me. Uh, today is July 24th, uh, and today's the anniversary of the Battle of La Belle Femme. And this battle is the climax to the siege of Fort Niagara in 1759 during the French and Indian War. The goal is to follow in the footsteps of the French relief column that is making their way towards Fort Niagara from the, from the Pittsburgh area. And uh, they're coming here to help save the fort. And we're gonna follow the last leg of that march. It's about 15-ish miles, um, but we're gonna do it. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, we'll take as close a path as possible. We have historic maps so we can trace the Portage Road and the River Road pretty accurately. Uh, and we're gonna weave our way through uh, the city of Niagara Falls to be able to stay on as close a path as possible to what uh, those French soldiers would have taken. All right, so this area right here is our first stop on our march. And the reason it's our first stop is because this is where the French relief column actually stops and gets off of their boats. This is a spot of a small storehouse uh, called Fort Little Niagara. Uh, and on July 24th, uh, the French relief column lands here in this general area and finds Little Niagara burned. Uh, it's in smoky ruins. And this is where they're going to start setting off on their hike to go relieve Fort Niagara, the main fort uh, at the mouth of Niagara River. This is where they start that hike. Uh, so this is where we're gonna be starting ours. So here we go, we've started our hike. And right now you can see behind us, I know it's a little blown out, but back there is the city of Niagara Falls. Our route takes us directly that way. So we've got the highway <laughs> uh, and then it looks like we'll have to scale into some some parking lots so this will this will be interesting we might as well give it a shot if we're not gonna do it no don't, don't do it so here we go I don't know looks pretty thick in there I thought it would have been like a marsh or something back here but we're good this maybe this won't be that tough who knows Ugh. So right now we're on Buffalo Street. Uh, we're walking away from downtown. Historically, it was just a straight shot from the river right into the Portage Road. Uh, but now we've got uh, buildings and gated, gated parking lots and stuff. So I, I figured that was our pretty straight shot onto whatever road we'd pick. Son of a gun, there you go. Neither is Portage Road in Niagara Falls. And I kind of figured that would be the one we we're looking for, but I had no idea the sign was there. That's new. So in reality, what we should have done was come out over here. So we weren't exactly in the right spot, but pretty close. Let's just hope this goes all the way through the city. I think it does from what I remember. Uh, so we're on the straight, on the straight and narrow as of right now. So we'll just continu continue doing this for like 15 miles. <laughs> as with most things in history, uh, to really understand them, you got to back up a bit. And uh, for the Battle of La Belle for me, which happens in 1759, uh, we're going to back up and really start uh, in the late uh, 17th century. The reason for that is uh, that's when the French first come to this, this area, the Niagara area, and they're exploring. And one of the major things they see, obviously, uh, is Niagara Falls. Uh, this massive terrain obstacle that stops any sort of waterborne travel. So you can't just sail over the falls. So what the Native Americans are doing before any Europeans get here is they're portaging, essentially, stopping where the water's calmer, taking everything out of their boats, putting their boats on their back, carrying the, uh, all their cargo and, and mode of transport 
to where it's safer, putting it back in and then continuing on their journey. And the portage up and around the falls is about eight miles, eight, nine miles. So it's not a small task at all. This slight takes forever, forever. I think we're just gonna go for it at some point. So in order for the French to take control of the Niagara River, which really is the key westward uh, at the time, uh, they build two forts. Uh, both of them fail pretty dramatically, uh, but by 1727, they actually complete uh, what we know as Fort Niagara today. Uh, but at the time, it's just one building. Uh, it's one building with a palisade around it. As soon as the French complete this, this fortification, it really pisses off the colonial governors in New York, the British governors. Uh, they're furious that the French have built this fort uh, in what they still see as, as the area of New York. But ultimately, nothing's really done about it at the time. So the French are actually able to they keep their fort, and they're the ones that are controlling all the westward travel along the Niagara River. So at this point, we're finally turning to make our way onto the actual uh, road that's actually gonna be on the river. We're out of Niagara Falls, we're done with that part. Now we're actually gonna be able to see the, uh, the river and the gorge, which is gonna be kinda neat. Hopefully it'll get us back on a path instead of like on the, on the freaking road, jeez. Um, but should be smooth sailing from there. We're getting to the path now. So as the 18th century progresses, tensions between the French and the English begin to mount. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for this, but here in North America, the big one is, uh, it's a question of who's gonna control the Ohio country. Um, and the Ohio country is referring to uh, basically Pittsburgh and the area around Pittsburgh. Um, the, the reason the English want it is because if they can control that area, that's another stepping stone to westward expansion. The French want it, for, for the same reasons, but as well, if they can control that Ohio country, they can link their colonies in Louisiana with their colonies in New France or in, or in Canada. And if they do that, then they're holding a, a, the land from Northern Canada all the way down uh, basically to the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico. That'll bottle the English up on the East Coast in those 13 original colonies we all remember from school. Um, and that's gonna be a big issue for the English. So this Ohio country is really key to who is going to control the North American continent. So what the English do is they dispatch a general, Edward Braddock, and his job is to go and take control of the Ohio country. And this happens in 1754. There's not a declaration of war between France and England yet. Uh, so England kind of takes, takes it upon themselves to go seize that area. But in his orders, he has an option. The next service, which is of the greatest importance and therefore demands the utmost care, is the dislodging of the French from the forts they now have at the falls and passes of Niagara. The erecting of such a fort there shall, for the future, make His Majesty's subjects masters of the Lake Ontario. And by that means, cutting off the communication between the French forces on the Mississippi. So that was an excerpt from Braddock's instructions for his actions in North America. <clears throat> now, Braddock can't take on Fort Niagara and Fort Duquesne at the same time. So what he does is he delegates that responsibility to a guy called William Shirley. Uh, Shirley is the uh, royal governor of Massachusetts at the time. And he raises two regiments specifically for this, this expedition against Fort Niagara. But by 1755, the expedition has stalled and only made its way as far as Fort Oswego and don't actually get to move on Niagara itself. And that's actually a pretty lucky thing. The time from 1727 when the fort is complete to 1755 when Shirley's expedition doesn't actually make it, um, those years haven't been really good to Fort Niagara. The, the garrison writes at the time that actually they're afraid to fire the one cannon that they've got at the fort because they're afraid that the concussion will shake the walls of the fort down. Um, not a great spot to be in. So by 1756, France and England are officially 
uh, at war. And Governor Vaudreau knows that Fort Niagara is not prepared for that war. So what he does is he assigns somebody who has probably the single biggest influence or uh, impression on Fort Niagara in Fort Niagara's entire history. Uh, and that man is uh, Pierre Pouchot. He's a captain in the Bierne Regiment of the, French, the regular French army. He's not an engineer, which is kind of wild. Uh, he's a regular infantry officer who they say has something like uh, specific gifts in engineering. Um, he does take part in a lot of the, the big sieges uh, during the War of Austrian Succession. So he's got a lot of experience uh, in siege craft, in siege warfare. But what goes hand in hand with that is how to build forts. So that's, that's our problem right there. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, the power authority has blocked off this path for whatever reason. Uh, so now we have to go on this path on the other side. Yeah, that, that right there, that's, it'll be interesting. So I uh, made it across the power authority. Uh, but of course, as I'm doing that, I notice the path right over there. It's not, it's not closed. It's open. You can just, you can just walk. You don't, you don't have to go up on the highway of death over there. It's, it's not a thing. It's not a thing. Sweet. So there's two major train features that dictate how we move along this portage. There's the falls themselves, and uh, they make the whole portage necessary in the first place. And the second is the escarpment, uh, and that's the change in elevation from the low-lying areas where Lake Ontario is and the higher area where the falls and uh, Lake Erie are. So right now we're at the crest of the escarpment, and from here you can see the entirety, the rest of Niagara County, and you can see how, uh, how and where the Niagara River empties into Lake Ontario. And it's pretty incredible sitting up here at the top and being able to see, you know, out into the lake and across and even even to Toronto across the river, which is pretty wild. So in the fall of 1755, Pouchot arrives at Niagara, uh, and what he does is he takes the latest and greatest um, military sciences uh, and engineering practices of the day, and he makes Fort Niagara into an incredibly formidable fortress out in the uh, Niagara frontier in the middle of nowhere. So by 1756, uh, Vaudreau is able to boast that Pouchot has built this incredible fortress that could withstand uh, any sort of reasonable British attack. So Fort Niagara has gone from a single stone building uh, in 1727 and now has been expanded into a large military complex. 1756 also brings a new commander. The Marquis de Montcalm is a general from France who's assigned to take over the military operations uh, in Canada. Right away, Montcalm starts to, to prove himself and he, he wins some victories, one of which Pouchot is actually a part of and unofficially takes part as an engineer. So Montcalm and Pouchot destroy uh, England's only base on Lake Ontario, which is a pretty big deal. That's Niagara's biggest threat, is that spot. Now it's, now it's no longer. Now Pouchot is actually able to go back to Niagara, this time as the Commandant. Unlike many European officers of, of both armies, Pouchot actually becomes pretty decent friends with the, the native nations that uh, encompass Fort Niagara and surround Fort Niagara, incurring favor with them, which is, uh, for the French military, as well as the English, is an enormous part of, of any success that they're gonna have in, the, in this region. Uh, Pouchot showed a pretty good aptitude for, for making friends and keeping good relationships with these Native American nations. Um, to the point where when Pouchot is finally ordered to leave Niagara um, and is replaced, when he's sailing out, there's a, a mention in his memoirs about two native warriors that swim out to his ship, uh, climb onto the ship, and uh, essentially they say, our father, the French king, must not love us anymore because he's sending away a chief who, who we love so much. So it was pretty clear that uh, Pouchot had a very good relationship with the Native Americans around him and did pretty good business with them. So we made it down the escarpment. We're now walking into the town of Lewiston. 
Um, and again, we don't need to go all the way down to the river, although roads do lead down to that landing spot. Uh, we're just gonna kind of cut across and make our way right to that river road, just like uh, that French relief column would have done. Uh, there's no need for us to go down by the water. Uh, I mean, we'll jump in at the end, I guess. So the first half of the war goes decently well for the French. Uh, Montcalm is able to lead French troops to victory at Carrion, which is today Ticonderoga, uh, as well as capturing Fort William Henry. But when we push into 1758 and 1759, um, a few things change. The British command structure changes for the better, leading to uh, more British victories against French troops. Uh, there's a few years of poor harvests, which makes food more expensive and more scarce, as well as the war expands uh, into Europe and contributing troops and materiel and support to North America is not, not on the highest priority list anymore. So this causes a few things to happen. One of the most significant ones is the higher command of the French army and uh, the government of New France start to butt heads. Uh, the governor of New France uh, Marquis de Vaudreau, he believes the key to winning the war is continuing to fight the English out west and taking control of the Ohio country. Whereas uh, Montcalm thinks that this is just a, a ploy to keep uh, the very lucrative fur trade open and profitable for the Canadian aristocracy, which Vaudreau is a part of. What Montcalm wants to do is pull forces back and protect the St. Lawrence which is the highway up to the, the vital port cities of New France. Pouchot seems to be in some ways caught between these two. On one hand, he is an officer in the army, uh, Montcalm is his superior. But on the other hand, Vaudreau, the governor of New France, has kind of been a champion in his corner since day one. Vaudreau several times puts Pouchot in for promotions and awards. None of it actually pans out, but it goes to show you how much Vaudreau really appreciated and admired Pouchot for his work in New France. Relations between Montcalm and Pouchot begin to kind of deteriorate because he's seeing Pouchot kind of get in bed with his, his rival, essentially, um, the governor. So it's, it wears on the relationship between Pouchot and Montcalm quite a bit until in uh, 1759, finally, Vaudreau orders Pouchot to go to Niagara and take over uh, for the current commander there who is Canadian born and is not really doing that great of a job. So in 1759, Pouchot is sent back to Niagara by Vaudreau uh, to reinforce and protect Niagara against an anticipated British attack. When he gets there, he's not super pleased what he finds. He finds that some of the work has uh, lapsed Things that he prescribed to be done hadn't been done, and there's been disrepairs. The fort's kind of in disrepair, uh, but he sets right to work again. But there's one thing that kind of leads him astray and is one of the biggest causes to uh, what's gonna happen uh, during the siege. So what Pouchot finds is that Fort, not only has Fort Niagara fallen into disrepair, but the relationships that he's fostered with his native allies, uh, the, Na the Iroquois nation, the those who live around Fort Niagara and the Niagara region, that relationship has also fallen into disrepair um, and largely by this point has been replaced. All right, as a disclaimer, talking about Native American relations during this conflict is incredibly complicated. It's something you'd have to spend a lifetime of study to really understand very thoroughly. Um, and I've not done that. I think I understand the basics enough to be able to communicate the scenario that these guys are facing. Um, so if I overgeneralize, uh, it's not a function of uh, trying to gloss things over. It's just trying to be able to make this and keep this a video about La Belle for me, not about an admittedly incredibly interesting topic of native and white relations during this time period. Um, so again, if I gloss things over, it's not to try and suggest anything is less important than anything else. But um, 
like this is a disclaimer, we're gonna speak in some sort of generalities here. So the English, just like the French, have agents who are responsible for keeping good ties with the, the native nations in their areas. The Indian agent for the English, a man named Sir William Johnson, has been doing a lot of work, even before this war started, to curry the favor and to get an official alliance with the Iroquois Confederacy. They've remained, as a whole, officially neutral since the start of the war. That doesn't mean that the individual nations of the Iroquois Confederacy have always done so. The Seneca, for an example, have mostly sided with the French. But throughout the war, and as the tables have started to turn against the French, it's made being allies with them more difficult. The Native Americans have their own wants, desires, and aspirations, and the best way to have those fulfilled is to be on the winning side. By 1759, with the Iroquois seeing that the tide is turning against the French, it seems like a better idea to ally with the English. And finally, uh, Johnson is able to actually get an official alliance from the council fire of the Iroquois Confederacy to the English, which is a big, big win. Uh, there's no way that you're going to be able to conduct a successful campaign in the wilderness without the help of the people who live there. It's just not happening. So in 1759, a General John Prudeau, who's newcomer to North America, is tasked with leading the Niagara Expedition. With him, he's got Sir William Johnson, who is commanding all of the king's allied natives, uh, the eyes and ears of his expedition. And to, go, to show you how vital those native allies were, Pouchot at Niagara, has no idea they're coming. The Native Americans who he believes are his allies, who he's been friends with since the last time he commanded Niagara, they all report, largely report, that there is no English intent on Niagara. There's nobody coming to the fort. Now, how much of this is somebody who is honestly trying to help but doesn't understand the scenario versus a deliberate counterintelligence campaign, I think is pretty hard to tell. But the fact of the matter is, so with that, Pouchot makes a decision that's ultimately gonna be a, a big mistake for him. What Pouchot does at the beginning of the summer is he acts on an article in his orders. Vaudreau writes in his orders that if he sees fit, he should send a large portion of his garrison to a Captain Lignery, who is gathering troops at Venango in order to start conducting offensive operations against the English in the Ohio country. Pouchot sends some of his officers and about 800 French Marines or Canadian regulars, he sends them out west to go and reinforce Lignery. Unfortunately, a little while later, Pouchot finds that the intelligence he was given was wrong. <laughs> and uh, Pouchot quickly realizes this is an English army that's landed in force to attack his position. Once that reality is set in for Pouchot, he sends a messenger very, very quickly to go retrieve the soldiers he just sent away. So this is a report to an English agent from two Iroquois warriors who are at a council with Lignery when he receives letters. What they say is, two Indians arrived with a packet of letters and delivered it to the commandant, who immediately opened it and after reading, talked a great deal with his officers. Then spoke to the Indians and said, children, I have bad news to tell you. There's a great army of English against us in Niagara with Sir William Johnson, who has with him all the six nations, with a great number of, their, of other Indians who live that way. I have received orders to go directly to Niagara and take you with me. We must give over thoughts of going down this river till we drove the English away from Niagara. You know the consequence of that place of both you and us. If the English take it, we must be poor, as it is stopping the road to your country. Children, we be strong and support your father at this time. And immediately upon reading that, Lenury mobilizes his forces. He forgets his goals uh, in the Ohio, 
uh, because ultimately, if Niagara Falls, what's the point of Ohio? You can't get any supplies or reinforcements out to Ohio without Niagara. So Niagara is clearly the more important prize here. Uh, and at the time, he's got about 1,400 men. So he has a pretty massive force uh, coming, coming back to Niagara with him. Um, and his force is taking the same road we're taking. Uh, they've used the waterways to get themselves through the lakes up into the opening of the Niagara River through Lake Erie. And Pouchot's told later, and he writes in his memoirs, that uh, Lenury's force, as they come into the Niagara River, they look like a floating island uh, with all the boats uh, that they have uh, in their column, which is pretty incredible. I mean, if you can imagine 1,400 men uh, in canoes and small whale boats all paddling together in one direction, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but then they land at Little Niagara, or what was left of Little Niagara, where we started this morning, uh, and then they've followed the path we're on right now. So yeah, we're still walking along the river, and you can see the river right back there. Um, this, this whole road just parallels the river the entire time, and it's super pretty. So by the time Lignery's force is moving down this road early on the 24th, um, Fort Niagara is not in a good state. Um, the siege has been going on for 19 days, and uh, the French garrison has been taking significant casualties. The fort itself, the northern wall, has almost been breached. Um, the English are very close to, to tearing down that northern wall and being able to, to move through that breach if they wanted to. Pouchot is kind of at his wit's end almost. Um, he's, things aren't going well for him. But on the flip side of that, the English are doing pretty poorly too. Um, in fact, I would say the English are almost doing worse than the French are. The English are very low on ammunition and powder and supplies. The, the biggest siege guns that they brought have been destroyed uh, through fighting with the French. But on top of that, Prudhoe's army is suffering from a lot of infighting. A lot of the commanding officers of the command staff, a lot of them don't like each other. But probably the biggest issue that they face happens all in one day. About four days before this, on the 20th of July, early in the morning, um, the commander of the New York Provincial Regiment is killed in the trenches outside Niagara. Uh, and then a little later in the day, uh, Prudhoe's second in command, uh, Colonel John Johnston, is also killed in the trenches outside Niagara. And then later that day, or later at night, Prudhoe himself is killed. Uh, he steps in front of a friendly mortar position when he wasn't supposed to. So in the span of 24 hours, three of the most senior officers in the army are all killed. And leaving a power vacuum like that inside of an army that already has a lot of infighting and a lot of garbage going on amongst themselves, is a recipe for disaster. Uh, Sir William Johnson ends up taking command, um, although a lot of people don't believe that he's the right person. Even though he's a general, he's superintendent of the Indian Department. Uh, a lot of people think his, his business is politics, not war. A lot of people believe that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Air Massey, the commander of the 46th Regiment of Foot, he should have been put in command, not, not Johnston but ultimately it is Johnson who takes the command. See, there we go. We're certainly getting there. Heck yeah. <laughs> it's taken a while, but we're getting there. So here's another marker uh, along this path. Uh, and as you can see, the Belfamy battlefield. Uh, the problem is this, this isn't the Belfamy battlefield. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why this, I think this is kind of necessary. <laughs> It's the fact that this exists. Uh, this is not the Belfamy battlefield, but what it is, it is another part of the story uh, for the battle. Uh, so where we're walking into right now uh, is what we call Bloody Run. Uh, but where we're stopped right now is where Linyary's column first makes contact with the British. Um, it's right down in here. Um, this is called Bloody Run. Um, and at about seven o'clock in the morning, uh, some warriors from Lignery's 
uh, column make contact with a party of British soldiers who are trying to put a boat in the water and, and sail across uh, the river to retrieve a cannon. Unfortunately for them, the party is caught and killed. Uh, and this is the first contact uh, by the French relief column as they're making their way towards Niagara. Uh, what also happens a little bit before this point is Lignery actually gets a letter from Pouchot. And Pouchot is able to uh, give Lignery kind of the disposition of the British forces. Based off of Pouchot's uh, letter to Lignery, we know and Lignery knows that while the British have more numbers, they're spread out. Uh, Pouchot describes them being spread out in a camp uh, behind the lines, in the trenches, and then a group over by La Belle Femme, uh, which is an area outside of the Fort of Bottomaya. It's an area where the higher shores come down to meet the riverbed, or to meet the river. Um, so we know that the British Army is split up between these three places, and it's very difficult for those armies, or those three parts of the army, to reinforce each other. Now, again, Lenny can't outnumber the entire British Army, but what he could do is go and pick off those little groups. And that's Lenny's plan, is to go in force and attack the British forces at La Belle Femme. And this is where he first makes contact. Now, it's also pretty special because we were going to shoot this right by the road. But thankfully, we met Rodney, a really awesome guy who was able to actually bring us down to the actual area where those British soldiers were attacked. So this is the actual spot right here, which is pretty incredible. So now, we're on the final approach to the battle. Uh, at this point, uh, Lignery's column has already made contact with the English, um, and they know where they are. They're at La Belle Femme, and uh, Lignery and his commanders are confident to be able to go in and crush the divided British army. But something happens that they, they weren't exactly expecting. Uh, the allies of the British, the Iroquois, a party of Iroquois warriors uh, meets up with Lenyuri's column, and uh, they talk with uh, Lenyuri's allies, and they convince them to sit out the battle. Very quickly, Lenyuri's force goes from 1,400 to about 800. But this doesn't deter Lenyuri and his officers. They're still confident in being able to come down this road and crush whatever British, little British resistance they find at La Belle Femme. So the other thing we have to keep in mind while we're walking here is this is not what this would have looked like uh, in July of 1759. Uh, there would have been a lot more trees, a lot more old, old growth. So even though La Belle Femme is just down that way just a little bit, it would have been very difficult still to see down that road uh, and to, to estimate what is actually there. So right now, this is the path that Lenyuri's column is taking to intercept the English. By now, Lenyuri's column would have been arranged for battle. And from writings, we know that Lenyuri arranged his column by a platoon with a 12-man front, with his Canadian regulars leading the way, and then militia behind them, and then natives behind them. The idea was to create a column that could reach the English line very quickly and smash it to bits. So here we are. This is about the spot where the trees break and then Yuri's column is moving into the open area of La Belle Femme. So there's a spot where the trees thin out and there's an open, more or less of open field where the land kind of moves down towards the river. And that's the La Belle Femme area. So right here, where we kind of see this man-made uh, downtown area, it's about where La Belle Femme would have taken place. So Lenyuri's column, right where we're standing right now, is coming out of the woods from over here and is gonna begin their attack on the English down that way. So here we are, we made it. This is the correct La Belle Femme sign in the correct place. So right here is, is La Belle Femme. This is where it scoots down right towards the river. And this is where the British are waiting for Lenyuri and his column. Now, keep in mind this whole setup of British soldiers, this took Lieutenant Colonel Massey about 30 minutes from getting the word to set up. The British soldiers heard the uh, engagement with Lenyuri's natives down by Bloody Run. They sent word back to the main army and Lieutenant Colonel Massey, along with his officers, bring as many available men as possible here to reinforce the light infantry and defend the road leading into the fort. 
and it's right here where the British make their stand. On the far right is where the Grenadiers from the 46th Regiment of Foot are gonna be stationed. To their left is gonna be the rest of their regiment of the 46th. To their left is gonna be a small picket of light infantrymen behind a breastwork, and they've been here overnight. And then on the furthest left is gonna be a picket of the New York Provincial Regiment, as well as a picket of the 44th Regiment of Foot. And this is the line that Aramassi sets up to intercept the, the French reinforcements. So this is where Lenyuri's column breaches the trees, right about where we see that red Jeep is coming right now. That's Lenyuri's column. This is where Lenyuri's column breaks the cover of the trees and makes its assault on the English column. They're gonna be going kitty corner from the road over there towards the center of the British line. So we're standing right now in, uh, right next to the Rite Aid's parking lot in Youngstown. <clears throat> and this is about where, approximately where Massey is gonna be during the battle. Uh, at the opening stage of the battle, he's standing up on a log to be able to see uh, Lenyuri's column coming in. And British soldiers write later that they come screaming and charging uh, out of the woods. Uh, they're still in a, an orderly column, but it's definitely not a slow methodical march. It's, it's very fast and with a lot of intensity, a lot of fury, and charging the British line or what they can see of it because Massey has his entire line laying down. Um, but as they're coming across this area, they're firing. Uh, and the British talk about receiving like a good 12 volleys from that French column as it's hurtling toward the British line. Uh, and from here, they're just sitting and waiting waiting for that French column to get closer and closer and closer and closer. And it's not till about here, this area right here, if the British column is about where that house is, that it's actually a laundromat. It's about 30 yards away is when Massey orders his men to stand up and fire. And it's from about that 30 yard range, almost point blank range, that the entire British line fires into that French column. A huge volume of fire smacks into the French column from the front and the sides where the Grenadiers are. Those initial volleys destroy the command and control of the French column. So the column kind of shifts, starts shifting, what they seem to try to form into a line of battle. And all the while, French are still getting fired into and everything starts breaking down. And French soldiers begin to run away and uh, unable to, to withstand the fire from the British any longer. The vast majority of them run back to the woods. So this is about where the light infantry is when they're told to actually advance on that retreating French column. And the French column is gonna be about where the post office is over there. And so these light infantrymen, they get the order from Massey, they come out of their earthworks and start to push the French back uh, into the woods. And it's at this point, when they see the retreating French, that the British allied natives who are in the woods come out and make their assault on the French column, and they just drive them further and further into the woods. So um, I'm at my place now. Uh, I recorded an ending to this video back in Youngstown, uh, and uh, as I talked about, it was kind of a, a nice fitting end for this whole walk, but on the car ride home and as I was cleaning up, uh, I, I think it needed a different kind of ending this battle, the Battle of La Belle for me is over in about 30 minutes. Um, and Pouchot thinks that it couldn't be Lenyuri's whole column, that this was just a scouting party. Uh, but unfortunately for him, this, that was it. That, that 30 minutes was all it took for the English to decimate Lenyuri's column and send the relief force packing. Um, and the, the French estimate their casualties to be almost 350. Uh, men and officers, but they really can't, uh, they're not sure exactly because of the, the flight that they took through the woods. Um, the English are counting their casualties as a, about 12 killed and 40 wounded. Um, so a huge disparity between the English and the French casualty numbers. But on a bigger scale, the reduction of Lenyuri's column really spells the end of Fort Niagara. Um, Fortresses are only supposed to be able to hold out long enough for a relief column to get there. And Fort Niagara did, it held out and the relief column get th got there, but it was destroyed. Uh, so without any 
a reliable source of relief in sight. Pouchot and the garrison really have no other choice but to surrender the fort, and that's what they do the very next day. So there's a lot of what ifing we can do in history, and La Belle Femme is is no different. Um, if Lenury would have been able to break through that British line, I think it's not crazy to say that that potentially would have saved Niagara from capture. Uh, who knows if that would have turned the tide for the French in America. Um, 1759 is a big year. It's a year of victories for the English. General Amherst takes uh, Fort Carrion, which is later Ticonderoga. He takes Crown Point. Uh, General Wolfe defeats Montcalm at the Battle of Quebec. Uh, and, and in Europe, um, the Battle of Minden is a victory for the English, uh, as well as English victories in the Caribbean. Um, so I don't necessarily think that securing Niagara would have been a massive blow to the English war effort. Um, but if you think about it, even if Wolf still would have won uh, at Quebec in the Plains of Abraham, that still leaves a large French garrison further down the river, um, which would have been something to contend with and would have made things a little more difficult for the English. Uh, but I don't really know if it would have turned the tide of the war, but uh, we don't know that. Uh, it's, it is, it's difficult to tell. Um, so there's so many other factors that go into it. So the fall of Niagara is a massive blow uh, for the French, but it's just one in a series of defeats that really kind of seal the fate um, the, of New France. Um, so uh, this was an incredibly uh, fun project to do. It, I'm, my feet are gonna kill me tomorrow, but uh, it was worth it and uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, studying Fort Niagara is something I've been doing for a really long time uh, and this uh, one specific part of the this sliver of the fort's history is one that's really, really interesting and unfortunately seems to, like I said in the beginning, kind of gets glossed over in a lot of, uh, a lot of books and a lot of tellings of the, the French and Indian War. Um, and it, it's an important piece. Uh, it was a thorn in the British side from the very beginning uh, when it was built in 1726 uh, until finally the English were able to add it to their list of victories uh, in the year 1759. Um, so this was, like I said, a really fun, uh, fun thing to do. Uh, I really enjoyed it and I'm really glad that you guys stuck around. Uh, I know this is a, probably going to be a really long video, um, but I'm curious to, to hear what you guys think. Uh, is, is this something that you enjoyed? Would you like to see more videos like this? Um, if you think that La Belle for me would have changed the course of history, let me know because I, I think that'd be a really interesting thing to debate and to talk about. Um, but uh, thank you for, for coming along on this, this trek. Uh, it, was, it was a good time. So I really enjoyed it. Thanks.